Here in this national cemetery lie men who fought to preserve the unity of our country, men who gave their lives to rid the world of oppression. And here, as in other national cemeteries, as well as in private and overseas military cemeteries, will rest the dead heroes of World War II. And they will be a lasting symbol of mankind's highest ideals, freedom from want and freedom from fear. Mindful of the great debt the country owes to those who fell in our defense, the Congress of the United States has made it possible for the next of kin to decide where final burial of the war dead shall be made. At the White House, President Truman receives Under Secretary of War Kenneth C. Royal and the Quartermaster General of the Army, T.B. Larkin, to launch the program for return and final burial of World War II dead and to deliver his message to America's next of kin. In his message, the President expresses the sentiment of the nation in deep and everlasting appreciation of the heroic efforts of those who, in keeping their country free, made the supreme sacrifice in World War II, the entire nation has been dedicated to disposing of the mortal remains of those honored dead in a manner consistent with the wishes of their next of kin, Harry S. Truman. At the War Department, a highly skilled staff of men and women of the Office of the Quartermaster General carry out the wishes of Congress. Here, under the guidance of Brigadier General George A. Horkin, every detail is arranged in accordance with the wishes of the next of kin, regardless of rank, race, color, or creed. First, personal contact is made with the next of kin of the deceased. This is done through the mails by the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard after consulting the serviceman's records for the next of kin. The records are kept in these files. They tell where the deceased is buried, how he is buried, and many other facts concerning his service to his country. This motion picture is designed to show in what manner the remains of a serviceman may be finally buried in the cemetery chosen by his next of kin. For this purpose, we take you to the home of the widow of Sergeant James Atkinson. Anything wrong, Martha? Oh, this letter came from the War Department, Mother. Oh? They're asking me where I want Jimmy's body finally buried. I can select a cemetery at home or overseas. What are you going to do? I don't know, Mother. What do you think I should do? Well, dear, I'm not the one to decide that. You see, you're the next of kin, and the decision rests with you. Now. If Jimmy hadn't married, then the responsibility would have been mine, since Jimmy's father is not living. I see. Give it some thought. Yes, Mother. It says here that I have four options. That means I can make one of four possible choices of cemeteries. I can bring Jimmy back to be buried in our family cemetery, or leave him overseas in the United States military cemetery, or have him buried in a national cemetery in this country. There's still another, but this one wouldn't concern me. What does it say? Well, he could be buried in a foreign country, his homeland, if, say, he were born in Holland or Italy or some other place. I see. Look, Grandma. Come on, Julie. Hello, Henry. Morning, Martha. Won't you come in? Hi, Julie. Sure grown up fast, isn't she? 
Looks just like... Oh, that's all right, Henry. She does look like Jimmy, and I'm glad of it. How much do I owe? Run along, honey, and play. Well, including today, that'll be 175. I see you got one of those letters from Washington. Papa sent one, too, several months ago. My brother George, who was a Marine, you know. He got it in Okinawa. Henry, what did your father do? I mean, where did he want George to be buried? U.S. Military Cemetery in Hawaii. That's the way George would have wanted it. Jimmy's in a temporary United States cemetery in France. Henry, maybe you could help me make up my mind. Be glad to. Won't you come into the living room? I've seen United States cemeteries here in this country and overseas. And I've talked to a quartermaster sergeant who knew all the answers. So you're really getting the facts firsthand. Now, suppose we start with the different kinds of cemeteries. First, the U.S. military cemeteries overseas. I saw one of them in Hawaii. I mean one of those temporary military cemeteries. They call them temporary because the War Department can't tell you how big a place they'll need for a permanent burial ground. Depends a lot, of course, on how many people decide on this type of cemetery. Now, when a site for a permanent cemetery is selected, the Army will transfer the remains from the temporary cemetery to the other. Whatever is done, a permanent cemetery will be nicely kept up. Grass and trees and flowers, well, just like you'd see back home. Bill McDonald, this quartermaster sergeant I knew, told me about a military cemetery in Italy. It was surrounded by the most beautiful mountains he'd ever seen. And not far away were olive groves. He said some of the Italian people were so grateful about being liberated from the Nazis that they keep putting flowers and wreaths on the Americans' graves. England has United States military cemeteries too, all looking very much the same as the ones in Italy and Hawaii. In fact, Bill told me that there are over 200 temporary United States cemeteries all over the world, all under military supervision. And every GI that's transferred to a permanent place will get the same attention. All of the expenses paid for by the government. Not only that, but an army chaplain will be on hand to perform religious ceremonies. And every grave will have a marker, cross or a star of David till a permanent headstone is put there. You'll find all that information in that pamphlet. Read the whole thing very carefully. That's what Mom and Pop did. It also tells you about national cemeteries in this country. I saw one on Long Island. Not much difference between the national cemetery here and the military ones overseas, except the ones over here are closer to the Statue of Liberty. If that's the kind of a cemetery you want, all you have to do is to ask for it. Oh, by the way, according to Bill McDonald, all the remains are positively identified before the Quartermaster General sends out a letter. In other words, if the War Department tells you that the body of a soldier is Private John Smith, then you can rest assured it is Private John Smith. There's absolutely no chance of a slip-up. I think a lot of people will be relieved to hear that. Indeed, they will. Some people wonder just who the government recognizes as next of kin. Yesterday, while I was having heels put on my shoes, I was explaining next of kin to Tony Corelli and his wife. Mamma mia. Here, I'll show you how it works. You see, when men under the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, they name their next of kin. But the Army has a definite order of next of kin. Here it is. If the soldier was not married, 
then the first person who would have the right to choose would be the father. If there's no father, then the mother. If there's no mother, then brothers over 21 years of age, the oldest one first. If there are no brothers, then sisters over 21. If there are no sisters, then relatives, the closest relative coming first. No. He's a no there. Okay. Let's look at the rest. Now, if the soldier was married, the first person who would have the right to choose would be the widow. Then would come sons over 21 years of age, the oldest one first. If there are no sons, then daughters over 21. If there are no daughters, then relatives, the closest relative coming first. No. He's not there. You see, Mr. Henry, Vincent is a not related. He have a nobody, no father, mother, nobody. He was born with the Tony enemy, but the, we love him like a son. Oh, that's different. Mrs. Bergman, she lent me this book. I want to know if Tony and me can be next to kin. I see. Well, in a special case like that, the best thing for you to do is to write to the Quartermaster General in Washington and explain everything. They'll answer and tell you what to do. You see, Mama, it's easy. Quartermaster General in a Washington. There's something else I meant to tell you, but it slipped my mind. Well, if I think about it, I'll come back. I know what it is. The milk bill. No, it isn't that. I'll get the money. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Henry. How do you do? My name is Thomas. Are you the widow of Sergeant James Atkinson? Yes, I am. I'm here to help you, Mrs. Atkinson. You're probably aware of the fact that your husband's body can be returned to this country for burial. Yes. Well, I'm in a position to make all arrangements for you. I have numerous contacts in France, and for a nominal cost, say, $50, you can put everything in my hands. Well, I... Now, Mrs. Atkinson, if I ask for $50, it's just to defray expenses. I ask nothing for myself. I deem it a patriotic duty. I think that's very kind of you. Only... Only she's not going to pay, mister. And what's more, she doesn't need your help. Just who are you? A friend. I don't like the way you talk, young man. That goes double for me. Why, you're just a racketeer trying to cash in on the sorrow of mothers and wives and everybody else who's lost somebody in the war. Well, you're barking around the wrong door. The War Department arranges everything, get it? Everything, without cost. And the best contact any next of kin can have is the Quartermaster General in Washington. I, uh, I, I, I didn't mean any harm. Not much, you didn't. Now beat it, scram. And don't try to cash in around here or any other place. What a horrible person. Yeah professional ghoul. But I'm glad he came. What do you mean? That's what slipped my mind before. Racketeers. Thanks a lot, Henry. Oh, that's all right. Well, here's the bill. Well, so long, Martha. Goodbye, Henry. And thanks again.